One of the most central tenets of Judaism, and by extension Christianity as well, is love your neighbor as yourself. And I wonder how many people actually understand the depth of this precept. Most people interpret it to mean love your neighbor in the same way that you love yourself. But this presumes that you love yourself. And what if you don't love yourself very much? And what if you despise yourself? What if you judge and condemn yourself? How will that affect your ability to love others? The fact of the matter is that everyone already loves one another to the degree with which they love themselves. That's the problem. This is why there is so much cruelty in the world, because so many people don't love themselves and therefore are not capable of truly loving others. How we treat others is a reflection of how we feel about ourselves internally. So there's really no need to tell anyone to love others the way they love themselves. We already do that. What is needed is to open up to the fullness of love, which is all encompassing and which includes oneself as well as everyone else. And scholars have been debating over the meaning of this precept for hundreds of years. But the problem with scholars is generally that they're too much in their heads. And if you want to understand anything at all about love, you have to come into the heart. And from the heart, this precept doesn't need interpretation. It clearly states, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, recognize that deep down there is no distinction between self and other. That deep down, we are all of the same spirit, the same essential nature. At some level, separation dissolves into oneness. And there is only the one which manifests as the many. Perhaps you've heard the saying that no man is an island unto himself. But that's not quite true. It really depends on your understanding. Because if you look at islands, they only appear to be separate at the surface. But if you were to drain the ocean of all its water, you would see that actually every island is just a small protrusion of a greater mass. And there was never any separation. So in the same way, every being is a part of the one being. And there is only the illusion of separateness. It's only at the surface, at the material level, that there appears to be separate forms and entities. But deep beneath the surface, there is no separation. And so every being is an island in that we appear to be separate from one another when in actuality, we are joined by the same unified ground of being. Now, when Jesus spoke about this precept, he emphasized the all encompassing inclusiveness of love by including even those who are antagonistic toward us. He said, it's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to love those who are kind to you, who care for you, who treat you well, and so on. But that kind of love is cheap. It's conditional. And we all know that kind of love. That kind of love, which is not really genuine love, can vanish as soon as the conditions change. How often does that love fade or even turn to hatred? when conditions change. So is it really love at all? Genuine love embraces all. There are no exceptions. 
because love is really the recognition of our shared spirit, the recognition that we share the same life. And so he went on to say, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for those who persecute you and forgive those who trespass against you. And for many people, this is just too much to ask. How can we love our enemies? How can we love someone who is antagonistic or spiteful toward us? And most people find this difficult because they have a very limited understanding of love. Often we limit love to a kind of behavior. We think that love means being affectionate. And how can we possibly be affectionate to someone who is antagonistic? But affection is really only one of many expressions of love. And love itself is not a behavior. It's the recognition of the unity of all life. And there is no one behavior or expression which defines love. Love can be expressed in any number of ways. So let's start with what does it mean to bless those who curse you? To curse someone essentially means to wish them suffering, to wish for them misery and misfortune. And so to bless someone would be the reverse of that which is to wish them well, to wish them good fortune, to wish them peace and happiness and healing. And this blessing of those who curse you comes from the understanding that their callousness is due to their deep unhappiness. I often make the point that those who are genuinely happy are never unkind. It's only when we are deeply unhappy that we behave in ways that are cold or callous or cruel. And so first of all, there's no need to wish suffering upon such a person because they're already suffering. And it's that suffering which is giving rise to their callousness. And so we wish them well, in part simply because we have compassion, simply because we empathize with that suffering but also because we know that if they were truly happy, they wouldn't behave in that way. They would be kind and considerate and caring. But sometimes simply wishing someone well is not enough. Sometimes what is needed is to act on that compassion, to do good to those who hate you. There may be people who hate you for no rational reason. You've never done anything to harm them. You've never said anything unkind to them. And yet for no apparent reason, they seem to despise you. And it could just be that they are a miserable person who doesn't like anyone. Or it may be that they especially dislike people who are happy or successful or have something that they don't have. Oftentimes, hatred is arising from envy. Or it may be due to some other reason altogether. But it's very difficult to hate someone who is kind to you. It's not impossible, but the more kindness a person shows you, the more difficult it is to hate them. So when you do good to those who hate you, which could be as simple as speaking kindly to them, or it could be helping them in some way. If you notice that there's something they're struggling with or something that they're in need of or whatever it happens to be. And for all you know, their hatred is arising from feelings of neglect or loneliness or a feeling of being unloved and uncared for. And your kindness could be the very thing that transforms them. There are many people in this world who are not well loved, who are starved of love, and their animosity toward others is due to having been deprived of love. 
Hatred is nothing more than the absence of love. Someone who is hateful is someone whose heart is closed. And often what is needed for them to open their heart is an act of love. To such a person, the smallest act of kindness can sometimes be immensely meaningful and transformative. It can be the very thing which awakens love in them. Now, apart from those who merely curse you and those who hate you, there are those who take things a step further and actually engage in unkind behavior, who persecute you, which means to harass or mistreat you in some way, to try and cause harm to you in some way, whether it's physical or emotional. But it's not merely a wish. It's not just the way that they feel about you. It's the way they behave toward you, how they treat you, what they say and do to you. And Jesus says, pray for those who persecute you, which again can simply mean wishing them well, to wish them healing and happiness, to pray that their hearts be healed and opened to love. And more than this, to forgive those who trespass against us. And I really like this terminology of trespassing because what we're talking about here is someone overstepping our personal boundaries. And that's what it means to trespass. It means to cross a boundary without permission, or in some cases to disregard a clearly defined boundary. So if you make it clear to someone that certain things are not permissible, if you tell them, please don't do that, or if you tell them no, or tell them to stop and they ignore that and continue, that is trespassing. And Jesus advises that we should forgive those who trespass against us, to forgive them for they know not what they do. So much of our unkind behavior is unconscious behavior. That is, there are unconscious mechanisms at play. There is deep underlying suffering, shame and insecurities, unhealed emotional wounds and so on, all giving rise to this behavior. And so the person is not even aware of why they behave as they do. And more than this, they are unaware of how deeply connected they are with the whole of life. And because of that, they feel isolated, alienated, disconnected, cut off from others. And they fail to realize that their behavior only widens that divide, thereby increasing their suffering. And so they don't realize what they're doing or why they do it nor do they realize how self-destructive it is. And forgiveness simply means letting go of resentment. A lot of people misunderstand this. A lot of people think that forgiveness means pardoning someone, which is to say not holding them accountable for their behavior, or perhaps even tolerating or condoning their behavior. But this is not at all what it means. Forgiveness isn't something that you do for someone else. Forgiveness is something that you do for yourself. All it means is letting go of that resentment because it's causing you to suffer. It's making you miserable and it's closing your heart to love. So we forgive in order to free ourselves from that misery not to free the other from accountability. People often have this misunderstanding in regard to forgiveness, in regard to love and compassion, that to love means to tolerate all kinds of abuse. And that's not what it means. You can love while at the same time enforcing boundaries. And that might seem 
like a bit of a contradiction because love means dissolving boundaries. But the boundaries that we're dissolving are the internal beliefs that we are separate from one another, whereas the boundaries that we enforce are external and simply in regard to behaviors, particularly behaviors which are predicated upon the sense of separateness. Because if I see myself in you, if I see that you and I are the same in spirit, I'm not going to abuse you. I'm not going to mistreat you or exploit you because whatever I do to you, I do to myself. But I'm also not going to tolerate mistreatment from you because that would not be respectful to myself. And also, it would be encouraging a behavior which isn't good for anyone. So instead, I might try to appeal to your innate empathy and compassion to try to get you to see the error in your behavior, to try and encourage you to behave with kindness. But if that doesn't work, or if you're so blind and so absorbed in your separateness that you simply will not behave respectfully, then I will remove myself from you. In other words, if a person will not respect your boundaries, you may have to extend that boundary to such a distance that they cannot reach you. And that means no longer associating with them. That means walking away and cutting contact with them. But that doesn't mean that you cut off your love and that you close your heart to them. Love knows no distance. Genuine love is boundless and unconditional. And so even though you have chosen not to engage or to associate with that person, there is still the recognition of a deep underlying connection and an honoring of that connection. As we've discussed previously, we all share the same spirit, the same consciousness, the same life energy. But the body and mind with its conditioned personality, with its various traits and characteristics, its beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, that's simply the outer covering. And to love is to see beyond all of that to the very heart of the other. And so you may not like the person. You may find that particular personality to be very unpleasant. And you may choose to distance yourself from them physically, but not at the level of the heart. Because you recognize that the personality is just a covering over the essence of who they are. But to really understand this, you have to see it within yourself. You have to look deep within beyond your own personality, beyond your own ego, to the essence of who you are. And the more you open up to that, the more naturally you recognize it in others. It's not something that you have to think about or force or something that you believe in in a sort of conceptual way. You just see it. You feel it. Whenever you encounter another being, it's as if you're encountering yourself just in a different body with a different mind and personality. And the only reason the other behaves in ways that are selfish or insensitive or unkind is simply because they fail to see it. And there may be nothing at all that you can do about that. What matters is whether or not you see it. Whenever we encounter animosity, whether in ourselves or in others, this is an opportunity to open up to love and not merely to be loving, but to be love because love is the essence of who we are. <laughs>